<laughs> yes, we can't ignore our wives, can we? No, but I have no respect for a man who doesn't try. <laughs> From comedy to sci-fi. Adventures in time and space. Told in future tense. You're listening to Old Time Radio USA. Now let's get back to where we were, which is about as boring a place as I can think of. Do you have a half hour to kill? Then stay tuned for... Half Hour to Kill. Here is a study in murder and suspense. Written, produced, and directed by Robert Webb's delight, we give you Blackout, an unusual tale especially designed for your half hour to kill. And now, here is William Conrad in Blackout. Tell me, Mr. Police Commissioner, how long ago did life begin for you? Forty, forty-five years ago? That's about right. Well, life for me began about 24 hours ago. That's all. 24 hours ago, I woke up. I was lying in a ditch beside a railroad track. When I opened my eyes, I saw the sky. It was clear and very blue. And I sat up and saw that my knee was sticking out through a hole in my pants. And my clothes were dirty and torn. And I started thinking, wait a minute, what's happened to me? And I rubbed my eyes like you'll do when you first wake up. My hand ran across something sticky. I looked at my hand and it was blood. Yes, dry, sticky blood. I, I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. In the distance, I could see a train. Could I have fallen off it or been thrown off? Then a man started walking toward me. He looked like a bum. I, I, I could see him quite a ways off. Hi there, young fellow. Yeah? You hurt? No, 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 I'm all right. What's the matter? Nothing. I, uh, I'm i all right. I'm a little dizzy, I guess. You've been kind of banged around. Get bumped off the rods. I, I... I don't know. But how'd you be here in the ditch if you wasn't bumped off the rods? I don't know, I tell you. Okay, Pete, okay. My name isn't Pete. Oh, I just call everybody that. Uh, what is your name? My name is... Why, uh... M my name is, uh... Well... I can't remember my name. You can't remember? What are you trying to pull? Don't know your own name. I tell you, it's true. I don't know. I can't remember. It ain't so easy to forget your own name, Pete. Look, don't ride me, will you? Something's happened. I don't know just what, but something's wrong. Where are you from? What? Where are you from? I don't know that either. I just can't... Can't remember. It's crazy. Say, you really got it bad, ain't you, Joe? Uh, let's see, I... I... No, no, it's no use. Well, uh, look in your pockets. Maybe you'll find something with your name on it. Yeah, that's an idea. Here, let me see. There's a handkerchief. Some keys. Any money? No, no money. Anything with your name on it? No. No, I can't find a thing. How about a wallet? Look in your coat pocket. No, nothing. Inside coat pocket's been torn, see? Looks like the wallet was torn right out. Yeah. You probably had a fight and lost it. Uh, this is hopeless. What am I going to do? If I was you, the first thing I'd do is try to find out who I am. That's kind of important. Yeah. I seen the train pass through, the train you fell off of. And it was coming from Chicago. Chicago? Yeah, it ain't far back. I'd get back there if I was you and start asking questions. Then I'd get myself to a hospital. You don't look good, Pete. You don't look good at all. Yes, 
Yes, Mr. Commissioner, that's how it started, with loss of memory, amnesia. That was bad enough, but if I'd known how much bigger and more terrible my problems were going to be, I'd never have come back to Chicago. Never. Well, I hitchhiked in, and when I saw how people were looking at my torn clothes, I thought I'd better pay a visit to a tailor. Good afternoon. Come in. Thank you. I... Such a beautiful day. I don't feel like working already. But when it's got to be, it's got to be. Now, what can I do for you? Well, my clothes Such are... Such a mess, yeah. You had an accident? Yes, I, I'm afraid I did. What's the matter with me? Sit down, sit down. You look terrible. You could use a little drink? Some brandy, maybe? Uh, no, thanks. I feel okay now. I'd just like to have these clothes sewn up and pressed a little. Could you do it while I wait? Certainly, and with pleasure. Look, go into the back room and throw your clothes through the door. You find a wash basin and you can wash that cut on your face. Well, that's very kind of you. Uh, th there's only one thing. Yes? I'm flat broke. I, I couldn't pay you for them now. Maybe in a day or so. All right. A day or so. A week or so. Go on. Make yourself at home. And while you're washing up, I'll mend the pants. Get them in first class shape. So I went into the tailor's little back room and took off my suit. Then I went over to the washstand and started to wash. Oh, my head felt better as soon as I got a little cold water on it. Then I sat down. And I tried to figure, what could I do? Where could I go from here? And then I noticed something about my pants belt. It was bulky. It had a little zipper in the back. And when I opened it, money started falling out in tight rolls. The bills were crisp and new. And I, I thought my heart was beating loud enough for the tailor to hear it as I counted the money. There was $50,000. <laughs> You can imagine how I felt, can't you, Mr. Commissioner? I didn't know what to do, where to turn. I thought of going to the police, but something in my subconscious warned me against it. And when the little tailor had fixed my clothes, I looked fairly respectable again. I went out on the street and began walking. I didn't know where I was going or why. $50,000. I tried with every ounce of strength to crash through that wall that separated me from the past, but it was no use. Well, I must have walked for miles because suddenly it was dark. Stopped and looked in a store window while I collected my thoughts. And then, in the window, I saw the reflection of a man in a white summer suit. He was a tall, skinny man, and he looked kind of familiar. Suddenly, I realized he'd been following me. Yeah, following me for blocks. It's easy to say now that I know what I should have done, Mr. Commissioner. I should have gone up to this man and had a showdown right then and there, but... Panic is a funny thing. It begins almost before you know it, and there's no cure for it. No cure at all. Well, I began running as fast as I could. I brushed against people, and I stumbled. And I didn't stop until my wind gave out and my legs weighed a ton. Then I looked back. I'd lost my friend in the white suit. But for how long? I had to find a place to sleep that night. And I saw this little hotel on the side street. I straightened my tie and wiped the sweat off of my face and started through the lobby. There was no one at the desk, and I rang the desk bell. A little fellow with glasses came out. Eh? Yeah. I'd like a room, please. Uh, rates are a dollar and a half in advance. Well, that, that's all right. No luggage, huh? No, no, I, I'm just staying overnight. That's all right. Very few of them bring any luggage. What's your name? What? I just want your name for the hotel register, though. Oh, my name. Oh, uh, the name is, uh, Bronson. Yeah, Howard Bronson. Howard Bronson. Mm-hmm. I thought for a minute you were going to say you were one of the Smith boys. <laughs> Here's your key, Mr. Bronson. Thank you. And now for the dollar and a half. Oh, yeah. 
Here you are. Twenty dollars. Is that the smallest you have? That's all I have. All right, I suppose I can change it. You sure it's good? Didn't make it yourself, did you? <laughs> it's good. Uh, no offense. Just my own little joke. Okay. Uh, take out another nickel for this newspaper, huh? Uh, sure thing, sure thing. Here's your change. Now, why don't you go up to bed? You look very tired. <laughs> tried to sleep, but it was no use. What had I done? Not knowing, not knowing almost drove me out of my mind. <sighs> out of my mind, I was already out of my mind. But then finally, I must have dozed off because I was suddenly in the middle of a terrible nightmare. No, 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 I won't give it. I won't. Stay out of here. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Bailey. Bailey! Mr. Brunson. Mr. Brunson. What? Are you all right, Mr. Brunson? Yes. Yes, I, I'm all right. Who is it? The room clerk. Would you open the door for a moment? Oh, yeah. Come in. Several of the guests heard you screaming. We wondered... Oh, it was nothing. Just a nightmare, I guess. I, I'm all right now, I think. I'm glad to hear that. Is that all you wanted to know? Not exactly. Well? A detective came in a while ago inquiring about somebody. Detective? Yeah, a city detective. That is, according to the badge he showed me. Who did he want? No one named Bronson... Then what are you bothering me for? It wasn't Bronson he asked for, but his description of the man fitted you exactly. How long ago was he here? About 20 minutes ago. Uh, your name is Bronson, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, it's technically against the law to register under an alias. My name's Bronson. Okay. I just wanted to make sure, that's all. He must have wanted somebody else. Says he's been checking up in all the hotels in this neighborhood. Uh, says he might drop back later. What did he look like? A tall fellow, kind of slim, wearing a white summer suit. White summer suit? Yes. Uh, you don't see many of those nowadays. No. Are you sure you're over your nightmare? Yeah, I'm all right now. Okay. Good night, Mr. Bronson. Good night. Oh, uh... Say, yeah? if that fellow does come back... Is he detective? Yeah, if he does come back, let me know. I just want both him and you to make sure that I'm not the one he's looking for. Okay, Mr. Bronson. Good night. After that, I didn't want to sleep. I got very jittery. I paced the room and smoked one cigarette after another. Why had I said that to the clerk? I couldn't be so lily-white with that $50,000 strapped to me. Still, maybe it had been better to have it out with a guy once and for all. Well, finally, I forced myself to sit down, and I picked up the paper and started to read. Front page was filled with news of a war I couldn't even recall. Names that meant nothing to the shadow that had engulfed my mind. But down in the corner of the front page, what was this? A detective slain on train. Detective slain on train. George Bailey, Chicago. Did... Bailey, the man in my nightmare, was found dead in, this morning in a room at on a westbound train. Police officials report that he was on the trail of one Joe Latterly, who was believed to have killed the detective during an attempted arrest. Police throughout the state are on the lookout for Latterly now. He is known to be carrying $50,000 in stolen cur... $50,000 in stolen currency. Now what was I going to do? I was not only a thief, I, I was a killer. But a funny thing, somehow I didn't feel like a killer. I didn't feel like a killer at all. Mr. Branson, that detective came back. He's here with me now. He'd like to talk to you. Uh, detective? 
Oh, yeah, sure. Be glad to talk to him. Will you wait just one second? I'll throw some clothes on. No, thank you. I wasn't having any of this. The only thing I could think about was getting away. I rushed to the window, raised it. The fire escape led right down to a back alley. Open up, Mr. Brunson. I slid over the sill and started down the fire escape. As I raced down the steps, I heard excited voices above me. And then... They were shooting at me. I was a killer. A killer at bay. Well, it was almost midnight, Mr. Commissioner. I didn't know what to do or where to go. I got away from the hotel without being hit, but feeling those bullets so close made me know that I had to hide out and fast. But I didn't even know my own name. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, yes. I did know my own name. Joe Latterly. The newspaper said Joe Latterly. I saw an all-night drugstore down the block. I just about ran all the way. I closed myself in the phone booth and started thumbing through the directory. Yeah. Sure enough, there it was. Joe Latterly. I wrote down my address and began dialing my telephone number. Well, the number rang. I felt a cold sweat come rolling down my face and neck. Soak into my collar. Hello. Hello? Is uh, this the Latterly residence? Yeah. What do you want? Uh, this is Joe. Joe? Yeah. I don't sound like you. Well, I had a little accident. Did you get the money? Yeah. Any trouble? I... I, I killed him. Oh. Look, I, I better see you right away. Yeah, but uh, don't come here. The cops are thick as flies. Better meet me at the usual place. The usual place? Yeah, at Mom's. Okay, at, at Mom's. Oh, uh, look, this uh, accident kind of must up my memory a little bit. Uh, what was Mom's address again? 229. 229? 9th Street, apartment 204. Uh, 204, yeah. Okay, I'll see you there. Gee, you, you sure sound funny, Joe. What happened? I'll tell you about it when I see you. So, I had a wife... She was in on everything. You see, Commissioner, the jigsaw puzzle was beginning to make some sense. A wife? And I couldn't even remember the color of her hair. Oh, if I could only break through that shadow. Well, ten minutes later, I was standing in the entrance of a very classy apartment hotel lobby. Not a soul in sight. And as I began looking down the list of numbers for the right doorbell to ring, I felt myself going shaky again. And there it was, 204. I pushed the bell, waited, and then the door buzzer sounded and I pushed open the door. I started across the lobby. No one inside, no one. Now that was a break. I pulled my hat down over my eyes as I started up the steps. You see, I was beginning to think like a hunted man, like a killer. I took the stairs to the second floor. And then I started down the hall. 200. 202. Uh, the next door. 204. The door was ajar. I wanted to call my wife, but what was her name? Honey? Honey, are you there? No answer. I pushed the door open. The room was in darkness. I felt along the wall for a light switch and found it. And there, waiting for me, was this detective, the tall, skinny man in the white suit. I let my nerves take over. I jumped from the room and slammed the door shut and started running again. But this time he had a better chance at me than before. As I ran through the empty streets, I could hear him coming right behind me. I ducked down alleys and across backyards, but he was right on my tail. I couldn't run much farther. I was all pooped out. And then I saw the lights of the elevated station ahead. And in the quiet night, I heard the rumble of the approaching train, the last train. I couldn't miss that train. I raced up the steps three at a time. When I got to the top, he was at the bottom. Ah, we're out, I'd never heard a deadlier sound than that voice. 
There was no one else on the elevated platform. Even the ticket seller had closed up shop and put a little sign in his window. Pay on train. The last planes were just pulling in. The detective was coming up the stairs. Kind of slow for some reason that I didn't have time to figure out. The train stopped and the door swung open and I got in. And the door closed and the train was on its way. I looked back and the detective was standing on the platform just looking at the train. I didn't get it. Why hadn't he come after me? I couldn't figure that out. And then I decided I'd better get some information from the conductor. Say, I beg your pardon, but could you help me? Yeah, sure. What do you want to know? Where does this train go? 190th. 190th. Can I get to State Highway from there? Nope. You're going the opposite way. Uh, I guess I kind of got mixed up in my directions. Well, the only way to get to where you're going is to take another car back to the loop. Thanks very much. That was what I wanted to know. I decided to get off on a block or two in case the cop was waiting for me at 190th. He must have figured he could beat me there and would probably have quite a little reception committee waiting. So I got up and started to walk to the door. Hey! Yeah? Where are you going? Oh, you said I was going the wrong way. I just want to get off the next stop. You can't get off to the 190th. This is an express. <laughs> I was just about ready to crack. I knew it'd be curtains for me as soon as I got off the train. I kept hoping for a miracle. Maybe the train would crack up or stop one station too soon or... Oh, but it was no use. 190th. Finally, the conductor called the station. 190th Street, 190th. And a half dozen sleepy passengers started getting up and heading for the doors. And then I got an idea. Maybe I could stay in the car. Maybe I could wait. When the last passenger got out, the conductor looked over at me. This is where you transfer back to the loop. Uh, where does the train go? Up a few blocks and we turn around and head back. Well, couldn't I go back with you? Sorry. You got to get out here and cross the bridge. But you're not I a... don't make the rules, buddy. The company makes them for me. But I tell you, though, you haven't... Hey. Oh, what's the matter? Well, I just got on the train behind you. Just come with me. I've got a gun right against your back. It was him. I felt the gun rubbing against my spine. I knew I had only one chance. So I whipped around. I was lucky. I caught him with a hard right and he went down. I jumped fast and got his service revolver. He didn't stay down long, though, and as he got up and lunged at me, I let him have it right between the eyes. So, there's my story, Mr. Police Commissioner. I'm Joe Latterly. I've killed two policemen, one today and one last week. I stole $50,000. And I'm tired of the whole thing. I'm glad it's over. It's quite a story. I don't suppose you remember how or why Detective Bailey was killed last week on that train out of Chicago? No. Well, we've reconstructed the crime pretty well, we think. It began a week ago when a fellow named Steve Roycroft came to headquarters with a complaint against one of his employees, whom he suspected of embezzling $50,000. And that employee was... Joe Latterly. I see. Latterly had disappeared and Detective Murphy was assigned to the case. Later that day, he found Latterly taking the morning train out of Chicago. He called Roycroft and told him about it. Both Roycroft and Murphy made the train on Latterly's trail. They confronted him and got back the 50 grand. Who got the money back? The man it rightfully belonged to, Steve Roycroft. Then where did I... Uh, Just a minute. Roycroft got his money back, but Ladley made another try. He overpowered Murphy and killed him. He would have killed Roycroft, too, but Roycroft jumped for his life from the speeding train. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You've got it wrong. I jumped from the train, remember? Exactly. But you don't understand... But you're not Joe Latterly, my friend. You're Steve Roycroft. When you got your money and jumped from the train, you lost your memory. Then when you read that we were looking for the killer in Latterly, you naturally assumed that you were him. Of course, we thought Latterly still had the money. Good heavens. What's the matter now? Don't you realize what I've done? What? Well, thinking I was Joe Latterly, I, I killed the detective who was trying to bring me in. Detective? Yes, just now on the elevated platform. But that wasn't a detective at all. Well, then 
Who? He was Joe Latterly, trying to get back his money, or I should say your money. Joe Latterly? That's right. There won't be any charges. You killed him in self-defense. Yes, it was Joe Latterly all the time. That's why you met him in that apartment. It was his hideout. Oh, I, I know this has been a great shock to you, Mr. Roycroft. Shock? <sighs> yeah. Hey, you're not well. You need rest. I've sent for an ambulance to take you to the hospital. The psychiatrist there will be able to help you recover your memory. <sighs> I hope so. I hope they can make me forget what I thought I was. How do you mean? I've lived the life of Joe Latterly too well. It's not going to be easy returning to the everyday existence of Steve Roycroft. I hope I won't become too bored, Mr. Commissioner. You have been listening to your preview theater, featuring Half Hour to Kill, a new treatment of the psychological suspense story, previewed tonight for the first time on any station. We know you'll be wondering when you can hear Half Hour to Kill again, and whether the forthcoming shows will be as exciting as the one you've just heard. Well, the series is available for sponsorship now, and will probably begin soon on one of the major networks. Those of you who have been sent preview theater cards can help bring this about by filling in those cards and mailing them back at once. We want to know your reaction to this type of entertainment. As to the future shows, we think you'll be interested in knowing about the people who make Half Hour to Kill the unusual show that it is. William Conrad, who played the lead in tonight's story, was recently seen in the motion picture The Killers where his portrayal of the heavyset murderer was so well received. Conrad can soon be seen in body and soul. The original music in Half Hour to Kill was composed by Henry Russell and conducted by Dion Romandi. The cast tonight included such radio favorites as Jan Keller, Paul McVeigh, Ken Christie, Norman Field, and Fred Howard. And the man who conceived this series is the well-known young writer-producer Robert Webster Light, from whose active typewriter have come stories for The Whistler, Suspense, Dark Venture, and dozens more of the top dramatic shows. A popular writer of psychological fiction, Robert Webster Light is perhaps best known as a director of unusual radio shows. So, remember Half Hour to Kill, because this uniquely titled series is destined to give American audiences many tents and exciting half hours to kill. Now, this is Gil Warren inviting you to join us next week at 9 when Warner Brothers KFWB presents another new and unusual radio feature on your preview theater of the air. Classic old-time radios all day long, right here, Old Time Radio USA. It is a dark brown or black mineral, and when newly mined, it gleams with a metallic luster. Its sources are few, its demand enormous. It is almost indispensable in modern warfare. Its name is Wolfram, and from it is derived tungsten, which is an essential ingredient of the high-speed special steels required for the deadly precision weapons of war today. Around it was fought one of the bitterest undercover campaigns of the last war. to Tales of the Foreign Service, one of a series presented by the NBC University of the Air, written and produced in cooperation with the State Department and dedicated to the men of the Foreign Service. 
The material used in this series is based upon the confidential files of the State Department, much of it never before released to the public. Our program for tonight is The Secret War for Wolfram. of Europe, there is only one important source for the ore wolfram, from which tungsten is made. It is found only in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. From the beginning of the Allied campaign to starve Germany of the essential materials of war, wolfram was high on the contraband list. But wolfram did not come to Germany across the ocean, where the Allied blockade could intercept it. Wolfram came from Spain, whence it could be shipped overland through Vichy, France, to German factories. There was only one way to stop the shipments at their source in Spain. But the Spanish government, for reasons of its own, refused to forbid the export of Wolfram to Germany. And when diplomatic efforts had failed to bring the Spanish government into line with Allied policy, the Department of State tried a new weapon. The shipment of oil and other petroleum products from the United States to Spain is hereby prohibited. The embargo will remain in effect until the Spanish government is willing to reduce drastically its shipments of Wolfram ore to Germany. For several months, the embargo remained in effect. Then the oil-starved Spanish government reluctantly capitulated to the American terms. And that day, Bill Jordan, young American Foreign Service officer in Madrid, was summoned to the office of his chief to receive the most important assignment of his career. Sit down, Bill. Thanks. You uh, may have seen in today's dispatches that the Spanish government has agreed to our terms on the shipment of Wolfram ore to Germany. Well, yes, sir, I saw that. The quota is 15 tons a month, isn't that right? Quite right. Pity we couldn't make it no tons a month, but we can't afford to drive the Germans too far. And 15 tons is only a fraction of what the German war industry needs. Now, that means the Germans are going to make every effort, short of an invasion of Spain, to get more wool from out. Beat the quota by smuggling, huh? Most probably. And with the current friendly relations between Germany and Spain, the Spanish custom officials cannot be counted upon to watch out very carefully for contraband cargoes. Aren't we allowed an observer in the frontier zone to take care of that? Yes, uh, we are. And uh, that's why I sent for you, Bill. Oh? It's an important job, Bill. I can't stress too much how important it is. If we can keep Wolfram out of German hands... We may shorten the war by months. Don't you think we need more than one man on a job like that, sir? <laughs> of course I do. But one observer is all the Spanish government will allow. Now, that means you're going to have to be in ten places at once, on a 24-hour basis. Think you can handle it? I'd like to try, sir. Good. You'll be thoroughly briefed in the next 24 hours by intelligence. And remember, it's absolutely vital that we keep Germany from getting this ore. Good luck, Bill. <laughs> physical report to help you identify Wolfram, Mr. Jordan. It is an isomorphous mixture of the tongue states of iron and manganese. The color is dark brown or black. Hardness, 5 to 5.5. Density, 7.2 to 7.5. Wolfram is found in western Spain, and the probable route of smugglers will be to Irun, the nearest frontier town, directly across from Ondai, France. Also, there are a thousand tons of Wolfram belonging to the Germans stored in warehouses at Irun now. Here are your maps of the frontier zone. Now, you'll notice that two railroads and two highways cross the frontier at Irun. All of these must be watched, as well as the fishing villages and the mountain roads.
Thoroughly briefed by intelligence officers, Foreign Service Officer Bill Jordan leaves for Irun, armed only with his maps, codes, his native wit, and his courage. His first step upon his arrival at Irun is to call upon a high Spanish official. So, you are the American observer in this zone, eh? What can I do for you, senor? Well, first of all, I would like to have a letter from you authorizing me to examine all invoices of cargoes crossing the frontier for Germany and to accompany the custom inspectors in their examinations of the goods. A letter, eh? See, I think that can be arranged. Anything else? Yes. There are a thousand tons of wolfram stored here in Irun by the Germans. They're almost certain to try and smuggle it across the border. That wolfram should be moved back to Madrid, where the Allies can keep a check on it. Well, that will be quite unnecessary. We have custom officials at every point on the border where the Germans might attempt to smuggle the goods across. Custom officials have been bribed. You speak as though the Spanish officials were corrupt and would permit a violation of the law? As a matter of fact, the presence of an observer here is quite unnecessary. There will be no smuggling of Wolfram. You won't help me then. But, senor, of course I will help you. I will give you the letter you wish. But you must be reasonable in what you ask. I cannot move other people's property out of the warehouses where they have stored it simply because you have a suspicious nature. Now, wait a minute. If you can bring any proof of smuggling, senor... Perhaps my attitude would be different. Until then, you must rely on my good faith. Very well, then. Good day, senor. Good day. I will have the letter prepared and delivered to your desk. Thank you. Uh, senor. Hmm? Oh, good morning. Colonel, isn't it? I uh, see. Si. Uh, come over here. I wish to speak to you. Sure. What is it? Uh, you uh, have been asking our cooperation in preventing the smuggling of uh, wool from over the border, eh? Yes. How did you know? Uh, your arrival here has not gone unnoticed, uh, Senor Jordan. Uh, there are uh, many eyes watching your movements. Uh, you did not uh, get what you asked for, no? No, I got the brush off. Uh, the brush off, yes. It will continue to be like that, senor. If you manage to intercept the shipment, you will have to send for the civil guard to make the arrest. And by the time the soldiers arrive, the evidence will have disappeared and the smugglers too. Yes, that's a possibility. It's a more than a possibility, senor. It's a certainty. If you ask the authorities for help in the usual way. But if you report your findings direct to me... Yes? I will act on my own initiative. The guard will arrive on time to make the arrests. How do I reach you? Uh, here is my card. Uh, call me at that number. Colonel Gonzalez. Uh, that is my name. Uh, yours, I know. And uh, now, is uh, there anything I can do for you immediately, Senor Jordan? Well, yes. I'd like to have the name of a trustworthy man who knows the country to drive for me. Oh, a trustworthy man. Uh, let's see. Uh, try uh, Pedro Montez at the Iberian Cafe. He will help you. Pedro Montez. Thanks. May I ask what your interest is in this, Colonel? Uh, the less you know, the better, amigo. Uh, do not attempt to reach me unless you have proof of a smuggling attempt. To American Consulate San Sebastian, attention intelligence officer. Request particulars, record and reliability, Juan Gonzalez, Colonel, Civil Guard, Irun. Also, Pedro Montez, Cafe Proprietor, Irun. Signed, Jordan. Colonel Gonzalez believed to have Republican anti-German sympathies. Pedro Montez, former member Basque nationalist movement during civil war. Both believed reliable. Are you Pedro Montez? See, si. I need someone to drive my car who knows the frontier country. You want the job? You are American, no? That's right. 
May I ask who sent you, senor? Colonel Gonzalez gave me your name. So? Then I will take the job. The point is this, Pedro. I want to build up a volunteer spy ring operating out of each village that will let me know of any suspicious activities or any secret shipments passing through. So? I want to know which custom officials can be trusted and which ones the Germans can bribe. The Germans will have to use Spanish workers to ship the ore. Now, I want contacts among those workers. They could let me know exactly what's going on. And how, senor, will you build this spy ring? I can't without your help. I want to visit each village and talk to the people there who are for the Allies and who can be made to see what it means to us to keep Wolfram out of German hands. Uh, I don't know who these people are, but you can help me there. Can't you? Si, senor. I think I can help. Your contact in the next village is Rodrigo Pico. Send any messages you have to him. He will pass it on, and it will go from village to village until it reaches me. Do you understand? I see, Senor Jordan. I am proud to help you. I want to know which of your superiors you think is acting for the Germans and which can be trusted. I want to know of any suspicious shipments that pass through this customs office, even if they've been cleared. Do you understand? Here is the door, Bill. When we get inside, do not stare at anyone, do not ask questions. Do whatever you are told. I understand. All right, then. Who is there? Pedro Montez. And who is that with you? The American. Come inside. Over here. Amigos. This is the American who has a message for you. Senor Jordan. I'm told that you are the leaders of the resistance movement against fascism in this section of the country. You can help the Allies to win in a very simple way. Get to your followers and tell them to have nothing to do with any shipments of Wolfram to Germany. If they hear of any shipments, have them let me know. I am watched by enemy agents, so it will not be safe for them to contact me directly. But my car is always parked in front of Pedro's cafe. The doors of the car will be locked, but one window will be open an inch. A message can be dropped through the opening and will be safe until I unlock the car and get it. If the car is not in front of the cafe, messages can be left in the cafe with Signora Montez, Pedro's wife. Will you tell your men what Wolfram means to the fascist armies? Will you cooperate with the Allied embargo? <laughs> Smugglers, nationalists, patriots, the simple artisan, merchant, peasant. Men who cherish the freedom of the human spirit. These were the elements Bill Jordan forged into a strong chain of observers covering the frontier, watching for the illegal shipments of Wolfram. And then came the first break. A message dropped into Jordan's car. Fifteen tons of Wolfram will be moved from the Bianca warehouse on three trucks tonight. The trucks will cross the frontier at the Ondai Bridge. Custom officials have been bribed to open the barrier half an hour earlier than the usual opening time to let the trucks through unobserved. Bill, Bill, wake up. Huh? Wake up, Bill. What? Uh, okay, wait a minute. Oh, Pedro, what is it? Read this, quick. Hmm? Fifteen tons of wolf room will be moved. Where did you get this? I come home very late. A little expedition, you know. I look in the car, the note is there. What time is it now? It is nearly 5.30. The customs open at 6. But if they open a half hour early, well, maybe we can make it. If there's any sort of a hitch, we can catch them. Run down and get the car started. I'll be with you as soon as I get my pants on. <laughs> Too late, not a sign of him. I am sorry. Not your fault, Pedro. You drove like a fiend. You uh, wish to cross the frontier, senores? Uh, no. 
You're open early this morning. I see it was for a special shipment of perishable fruits. Oh, a shipment of fruit in trucks? I see, three trucks. And you pass the shipment? Well, but of course. Well, that's that. Guess we can get back to bed, Pedro. Uh, good day, signore. Good day. Okay, Pedro, tough luck. Senor, Senor Jordan, this side of the car. Oh, hello, Juan. Senor, I saw that shipment. There was fruit on top of the truck, yes, but underneath was wool from So I was told. Couldn't you do something? No, no, I'm only a guard. I'm not an inspector. I see what I see, but I can do nothing. Well, that's all right, Juan. I think I've got enough to make an official complaint to the government. <laughs> An anonymous message. The testimony of a guard who did not inspect the shipment. And for that, you wish me to move tons of ore from here to Madrid. So long as that ore remains here, there will be attempts to smuggle it out. There is no smuggling across the Spanish border. I tell you, the custom officials were bribed. They opened the barrier a half hour earlier than the legal hour. A half hour early. See, that is sometimes arranged when shippers have a perishable cargo. Naturally, they recompense the custom officials for their extra time and trouble. But to talk of bribery is absurd. Senor, there is no doubt whatever that 15 tons of wolfram crossed the border illegally at 5.30 this morning. On the contrary, there is every doubt in the world. There is no smuggling across the Spanish border. That is final. <laughs> There's only one thing we can do to get action out of the government, Pedro. We've got to catch the smugglers with the goods. See. Si. Then we can throw it into the teeth of these axes loving officials and force them to take action. I'll get it. Jordan. Mr. Bill Jordan. That's right. Every move you make is watched, Mr. Jordan. You will not be allowed to interfere with our plans. If you persist in meddling, the consequences will be unfortunate for you. That is all. That's not all, you lisping hunk of sauerkraut. Hey, hung up. It was a threat, no? Yes, Pedro, a threat and a mistake. They're out in the open now. It means we're too close on their trail for comfort. Next time, we'll get them. The next time, an anonymous phone call a few days later. Drive out one kilometer on the Santos Portos Road tonight until you reach a lighted lantern by the side of the road. Pick up the lantern and walk across the field on your right until you come to a deserted wine cellar. Arrive there at 10 o'clock precisely. You are warned to come alone and to carry the lantern. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. I'll be there. <laughs> I come with you, Bill. Why? Afraid of a trap? Perhaps. I do not like these arrangements. Let me come with you, Bill. Oh, now, don't worry. This is just some woman with a jitters who doesn't want to be seen talking to me. Ah. Now, you wait here. Don't worry if I'm not back right away. This may take a little time. I can't see a thing. This darn lantern. It looks like steps ahead. Yes, the wine cellar. Mr. Jordan. That's me. Put out your lantern and come inside. Okay. I can't see much. This way? Yes, that is all right. Why all the hocus pocus? It is as much as my life is worth to be seen talking to you. Really? It is true. Not the Spanish, the Germans. They would kill me. I see. What did you want to tell me? I know where the Germans have hidden 30 tons of wool from. It is in a farmhouse near the frontier. They will move it across into France tomorrow night. And you know the farmhouse? See, si. It is my house, senor. Home? For... For $3,000, I will take you there. Oh, I see. $3,000. My husband is in the house. He is working for the Germans. 
He will be captured if you act on my information. I will be alone, senor. I have my own life. Three thousand dollars is not too much for a life. I haven't got three thousand dollars. But you can get it. Probably, if you're telling the truth. But first I want to see the Wolfram. I can trust you. If you're telling the truth, you'll get your money. Now take me to the house. <laughs> I'd better stop the car here. Turn off your lights. The lights. Okay. Now what? Follow the small road to the left until you reach the sea. Then turn right. In half a kilometer, you will come to a house. That is where the Wolfram is. You are not coming with us, Senora? I dare not. If there is trouble and they recognize me... I see. What are you going to do? I go back to town now and hide. Okay. And my money? If the Wolfram is there, your money will be waiting for you at Pedro's Cafe within two days. You despise me, do you not, senor? Believe me, I would help the Allies for nothing, but it is hard to give up one's husband. And I will be alone. I understand, senora. Come on, Pedro. Let's get going. That's the house, right ahead. You think you can find it again in daylight? Sure, easy. Then we will not go any closer now. There may be a guard. I've got to go closer. I'm going into the house. But that is crazy. They do not move the wolf from until tomorrow night. We have plenty of time. We will return with soldiers in the morning. That way there is no risk. Look, Pedro, I've got to be sure there's Wolfram in the house before I call the guard. Ah. If we give a false lead just once, the Spanish will refuse to investigate any of our complaints from then on. I can't afford to be wrong. I've got to see what's in that house. Then I go with you. No, Pedro, it's silly to risk both our lives. I go with you, Bill. <laughs> okay, then. You're stupid and you look like a gargoyle, but let's go. like the kitchen window. Is it locked? I'll see. No. Give me a boost. See, si, see. Si. Okay, I'm in. Let me give you a hand. See, si, see. Si. Now what? We must look for the cellar door. Don't use your lights. Too dangerous. Listen. Oh, someone's still awake. Hope they don't get hungry. Uh, I do not like. I do not like either. Here's the door. Shall I use the light? Okay, careful with it. Sure, sure, sure. See, see, this is it. Steps going down. Come on, Bill. Close the door behind you. Okay. See anything? Not yet. Ah, see. That's it. Wolfram, give me the light. Here, here. <coughs> That's dumb it. Quick, quick, under the steps. Who is there? Answer, I'll shoot. Answer, I say. You want another light, Hans? No, my dear, I can see. There's nothing here. It was rats. When the Nazis were you up, there will be no more rats. Come on, Hans, this depressing cellar bores me. Yeah, my dear. Pedro, see. Si. Wait five minutes, then get on back to the car and notify Colonel Gonzalez. If we're lucky, we're not only going to capture some Wolfram, we'll get a couple of German intelligence agents, too. Boy, will that make headlines. But what about you, Bill? I'm going to wait here until you get back with the guard. I'm not going to take any chances on these birds getting the wind up and moving this stuff tonight. You will take my pistol, then. Yes, I guess I'd better have the pistol. Never fired one, but you never can tell. <laughs> in the name of the law. What is the meaning of this? Who are you? Colonel Gonzalez, Spanish civil guard. You are under arrest. Cover him, Sergeant. See, si. The house is surrounded. Resistance is futile. Stand back and let us in. This is an outrage. What do you want? 30 tons of wool from Amigo. It is this way, Colonel. Bill, Bill, you are all right? Sure, and so is the wolf from Those Gestapo boys are sure right about the rats down here. 
All I could do to keep from taking a pot shot at him. I have been in contact with Madrid, Senor Jordan. And my government feels that in view of the unfortunate circumstances you have uncovered and the incontrovertible proof that German agents have been operating on Spanish soil, all the Wolfram ore stored here in Iran will be moved to Madrid at once, as you request. I am informed that my government will no longer be satisfied with that step, sir. We want all Wolfram belonging to Germany confiscated. <laughs> The secret war for Wolfram was not won in a single battle, but from his first victory over the Axis, Bill Jordan and his volunteer agents went on to successive triumphs. While British and American agents kept a tight check on all purchases and shipments of the ore from mines and stores, until a desperate Wolfram-starved Germany was eventually forced to attempt importing the ore from Japanese-occupied territory in submarines they vitally needed for the war in the Atlantic. for Wolfram was not won by any single person, but Bill Jordan's great success on the Spanish frontier was an outstanding campaign in that war and an enduring testimonial to the ingenuity and courage of the American Foreign Service officer. You've been listening to Tales of the Foreign Service, one of a series presented by the NBC University of the Air, written and produced in cooperation with the State Department and based upon confidential State Department files. Classic old-time radio all day long. This is Old Time Radio USA. <laughs> Agatha Christie's Poirot. From the thrill-packed pages of Agatha Christie's unforgettable stories of corpses, clues, and crime, Mutual now brings you, complete with bowler hat and magnificent mustache, your favorite detective, Hercule Poirot. In Murder Wears a Mask. I'd like to speak to Mr. Poirot. Uh, won't you come in? Your name, please? Richard Fields. Uh, Mr. Poirot's busy at the moment. Please sit down. I'll tell him you're here. Thank you. Uh, there's some magazines on the table at your left. Uh, Mr. Poirot, it's a Mr. Fields. Eh? Well, he can wait. He's a very patient man. He only rang the bell once. Here, Abigail, I want you to taste this sauce now. Mmm. Mmm, it's good. Good? Oh, ma foi, Abigail, it is superb. There are only three people in the world who know how to prepare this sauce. And you are about to become the fourth. Now, you take two tablespoons... Chief, there's but... someone waiting. Uh, ah, oui, this Monsieur Fields, eh? I suppose we must see him. Come. Mr. Fields, this is Mr. Perrault. Oh, how do you do? Bonjour, monsieur. Well, it uh, must be an important matter which calls you away from your business at the moment when it is most active. Well, as a matter of fact, I don't recall mentioning my business. But it was not necessary, monsieur. The Journal of Wall Street in your pocket tells me you are a stockbroker. Since it is only now three o'clock, it is obvious you left your office shortly before the closing of the exchange. Oh. Now, you would not do this for a minor matter. Oh, you're right. I've come to you on a matter that affects me very deeply. It concerns my daughter's welfare. Uh -huh. You see, Mr. Perot, she's quite young, not quite 18. 
And at that, she's rather immature for her age. Uh, yes, yes, monsieur, but uh, let us come to the point, please. I have a sauce cooking, uh, important business waiting for me. Well... Now, uh, what is the young lady's difficulty? She met this ham actor when he went up to her school to address the dramatic society. He's still quite distinguished looking in a dissolute sort of way, and she promptly became infatuated with him. It's partly his reputation, I guess. He's been a matinee idol for 20 years. Well, that uh, seems very normal behavior for a young girl of her age. Yes, but the horrible part of it is that he became equally interested in her. Why, the man's old enough to be her father. Oh, you must have heard of him. His name... Wait, 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 wait monsieur, please. I should prefer to hear all the facts before you mention any names. I never like to engage in idle gossip. This is no gossip, I assure you. I was up at this... at this man's apartment only an hour ago. He was showing my daughter a necklace he had bought her as a wedding present. Hello, monsieur. He woos her with diamonds. <laughs> it is not illegal. In this case, Mr. Poirot, it's immoral. She's too young to see through him. Uh -huh. But uh, why do you come to me? I want you to help me break up this affair. Oh, monsieur, what The man has led a sordid life. You're an investigator. If you dug around, you could produce proof of some of the things he's done. Proof that even Laura would have to believe. I'm sorry, monsieur. You've come to the wrong person. My talents, such as they are, are not available for such enterprises. Good day, sir. I can afford to pay you well. Monsieur... No one in the world is rich enough to buy Hercule Poirot. Now, you will excuse me, please. I have important work in the kitchen. All right. I can't force you to do it. But I want you to know that you're leaving me no alternative. Eh? What do you intend to do? Something very simple, Mr. Poirot. And at the same time, very conclusive. Good day. <laughs> Come in. Oh, Hackett, you got here fast. I was worried, Mr. Tremaine. This is the first time you've ever called me back on my day off. I suppose that's a pretty reckless thing to do to a valet these days. <laughs> no, sir, just startling. Is anything wrong? I'm afraid so. You ever seen this before? Why, yes, sir. It's the jewel case you had out this morning. I gathered it contained a pearl necklace which you bought for Miss Fields. Yes. $10,000 necklace. A wedding present. Yes, sir. Open the box, Hack. They're very lovely, sir. Are they? Oh, yes, sir. Very lovely. Hackett, you're a liar. I beg your pardon? You're a liar. You know perfectly well these are not real pearls. Mr. Tremaine, surely you're just... You've made a mistake, Hackett. You thought I was a complete fool, didn't you? You waited till Laura and I left for the theater at 2 o'clock and then substituted these cheap, cultivated pearls for the real ones, hoping I'd never find out until it was too late. I couldn't do that, sir. The pair of pearls were in the safe, and I don't know the combination. Who put them in the safe? I did. You asked me to. But I didn't ask you to leave the safe open, did I? I remember now that I didn't hear you twirl the knob. What did you do with those pearls? I never touched them. Very well. I'll give you your chance. Now I'm turning you over to the police. Don't touch that phone, Tremaine. Oh, you cheap, bungling thief posing as a valet. I should have realized what a bad performance it was. Well, I'm sure your experience will come in handy in prison. Drop that phone, Tremaine. Get your hands off me. All right, Tremaine, you asked for it. What are you... Put down that knife. Put down that... No! I can... I can... Exit. Mr. Tremaine... Hello, Mr. Fields. Yes. This is Archie Tremaine. Tremaine? Where's Laura? Right here at my place. You filthy swine. I told you this afternoon I wouldn't have her seeing you. Well, I don't see how you can stop her. We're getting married tonight. Married? Yes. We'd like to have your blessing. Why don't you come down? I wouldn't come down. Yes. Yes, maybe I will. Sure. I'll give you my blessing, Tremaine. Wait for me. I'll be down in 20 minutes. Don't worry. I'll be here. And so will the police. Mm. 
Inspector Stevens, I tell you, the next time we have dinner together, it will be in a place without a telephone. Then I will be certain at least we can uh, finish our dessert without interruption. All right, here we are. This is the place. You could have stayed and finished your dessert, Poirot. I didn't take you by force. It is the same thing. Why, you you very slyly tell me you have received an anonymous call reporting a murder. Oh, you know I cannot resist such a situation. He has excellent taste, this Monsieur Archie Tremaine. Me, I like very much these brownstone houses. Uh, Nobody home. Place is dark. Uh, We're probably on a wild goose chase. But the door, it is open. And the light switch, I presume, is here. So, and now? Well, we better start looking around just to make sure. Now, let's try the library first. It should be... There's no doubt down this hall here. All these brownstones, you know, they are very much the same. Uh, Inspector, flash your light around, please, eh? All right. Uh Aha, here's the switch. Tremaine... Tremaine. Yeah, he's dead all right. Stabbed through the heart. Stabbed once, Inspector, with with that letter opener. He must have dropped on the spot. There's no other blood around, just that one big pool he's lying in. And these bloody footprints all over the floor. Uh, They must be the murderers, Poro. He stood over the body to make sure Tremaine was dead and didn't notice that the blood was oozing around his shoes. Then he went over to the desk here, maybe to make a call... And into the bathroom to wash his hands. And he came out, headed for the door, and... And, uh, what, Inspector? Well, I'll be... Well, the footprint stopped suddenly. I don't get this. Inspector, have you observed this newspaper? Half the front page is torn off. Do you think the murderer dried his shoes with it? No, no, Inspector. I, I believe this is what happened. He did all the things you have described. Then, when he reached this point where the footsteps stopped... He realized that his shoes were bloody. Well, he could not go out wearing such shoes, and he could not carry them in his hands. Now, he looked down, and voila, he sees another pair of shoes. Fine, clean shoes, free of any blood. Where? On the feet of the dead man. You mean these shoes belong to the murderer? But obviously. They are covered with blood, and the laces are open because the shoes are a trifle too small. Mm -hmm. Now the murderer put on the dead man's shoes, he finds they are too large. So he tears up part of the newspaper and stuffs it into the shoes in order that he may walk with more comfort. By Jove, Poirot, I believe you're right. Eh. Now all you have to do is to find the owner of these shoes. Uh, We'll try it through checking the manufacturer's code number. Wait, perhaps I can make the task easier, Inspector. I think you will find that the owner of these shoes is a stockbroker named George Fields. Now, look, Poirot, this is too much. You've been working your little gray cells overtime. How can you... No, 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 no. I will explain, mon ami. I will explain. You will notice that the heel of the right shoe is worn down considerably more than the left. Earlier today, this uh, Monsieur Fields, who limps rather badly, came to see me. He uttered dire threats against someone who fitted the description of poor Monsieur Tremaine here. So, you see, Inspector, I employ the sharp eyes and the ears rather than the little gray cells... And they tell me that you had better question this Monsieur Fields at once. Well, Poirot, you were right. We've got Fields here at headquarters under lock and key. He's our man, all right. He was trying to burn Tremaine's shoes when we called on him. You are sure he is the guilty man, eh? Of course. He tried to tell us some cock and bull story about getting a call from Tremaine and finding him dead when he got there. Says he got his shoes all bloody before he saw the body, and then he became panicky and changed them. Just as I thought. Mm-hmm. Ah, but he's the killer, all right. You said yourself he threatened Tremaine. It's an open and shut case. Well, myself, I always mistrust the open and shut cases. Uh, tell me, what of the anonymous telephone call you received? Well, the way I figure it, Poirot, Fields called us himself, and then he thought maybe he could beat the rap, so he wiped off all his fingerprints, changed shoes with a dead man, and ducked. Oh, oh. a very intelligent reconstruction, Inspector. Very intelligent. <laughs> Alors, I must return to my office now. If anything new... I'll let you know. Good, good. Bonjour, Inspector. Mr. Poirot. No. 
Oh, Mademoiselle Fields. Mr. Poirot, may I please talk to you for just a moment? Oh, but of course, but of course. I, I know how distraught you must be. Uh, well, here is a bench in the corridor. I, I don't think we will be disturbed here. Thank you. Mademoiselle, let me assure you of my great sympathy. If there is anything I can do... There I'll... is, Mr. Poirot. You can prove my father is innocent. Well, that would be extremely difficult, Mademoiselle. All the evidence seems to point to his guilt. Well, I don't care about the evidence. He didn't do it. He couldn't. He was in my office, Miss Fields, and he threatened to take desperate measures. He lost his head, but he didn't mean what he said. And he was there in Monsieur Tremaine's apartment about the time of the murder. He admits this. Well, of course he admits it. He has nothing to hide. Ah, but at first, Mademoiselle, he did deny it. And oh, the exchange of shoes, the removal of the fingerprints. Oh, no, these do not seem to be the acts of an innocent man. Mr. Poirot, he was trapped. Someone lured him down there and planted the evidence to convict him. Hmm? That is what he tells us, and I will not say it is impossible, you know, but there must be proof. Don't worry, I'll find it somehow. George will help me. George? Oh, that is Monsieur Hackett, eh? Yes, Archie's valet. He knew a lot about Archie... He's downstairs now talking to the detectives. I'll go and get... Oh, oh, here he comes. George! George! I beg your... Oh, Miss Fields. How are you? George, this is Mr. Poirot, the great detective. Well, how do you do, sir? I've heard of you, of course. Enchanté, monsieur. I have heard fine things about you, too. Oh, thank you. George, you've got to help me find the murderer. Well, Miss Fields... Go on, and say it. You think my father's guilty? No, I won't say that, but I don't see how I can help you. Well, did Mr. Tremaine have any enemies? Anyone who hated him? Enemies? I don't think so. Of course, there were many people who disliked him. Why, monsieur? Well, frankly, sir, he was rather an egomaniac. He couldn't stand being in the background for a minute. It was always top billing for Archie Tremaine. But as I told the police, I don't... Uh, I can't think of anyone who'd want to... Kill him? Well, maybe some woman who was uh, jealous about the necklace. The necklace? Yes, the pearl necklace he was going to give me. You were there, George, when he showed it to me that afternoon. Oh, uh, yes, miss. I heard some conversation about it. Of course, I didn't see it. Mr. Poirot, the police found the necklace, didn't they? Matched pearls with a small diamond clasp. No, mademoiselle, I, I do not believe so. I myself saw everything that was found in the house, but this is the first I have heard of a necklace. Oh, uh, monsieur, I, I hope you will not be offended if I, if I ask about your movements on the day of the murder. Now, that was the first thing the police asked me, Mr. Poirot. It was my day off. I left Mr. Tremaine's apartment shortly after he did and spent the rest of the day and the whole evening with my parents. Oh? I do that every week on my day off. I see, I see. You, your parents, they live here in this city, huh? Yes, of course. They share a flat with me. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I was merely curious, you know. Mademoiselle, I do not know where this matter of the necklace may lead us, but it gives one furiously to think. What say you, Monsieur Hackett? I think Miss Fields has brought up something important. Something very, very important. Now listen, you two. You live with me, do you understand? The date was April 5th, Thursday, and I was here all evening. Were you, George? That's interesting. I don't like your tone, Daisy. And I don't like getting the short end of the deal all the time. What? What is this, Peter? Hold up. No, oh, no, Hackett, I wouldn't say that, but we do all the dirty work as a rule, and you get most of the dough. Well, this time I've done all the dirty work, and you just have to be smart. That little chubby Frenchman or Belgian or whatever he is doesn't look like much, but don't let his accent and that that phony-looking mustache fool you. It's going to take great acting to make him believe that you are my parents. And it's going to take a great deal more money to make us try it. We don't want to... All get... right, all right, I'll double your share on this job, but watch yourself... Uh, that may be him now. I'll wait in the next room. Just in case. Uh, no rough stuff, Hackett. Now, we'll handle it with kid gloves. Yes? Bonjour, madame. My name is Poirot, Hercule Poirot. May I have a few words with you? Well, yes, come in. 
Uh, what is it, Mama? A gentleman, Pa. man named Pearl. Uh, yes, oh. and, and my secretary, Miss Thatcher. Uh, how do you do? Oh, howdy. Excuse my shoes being off. We wasn't expecting any callers. Oh, no, 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 no. Do not be deranged, monsieur. We will be here only a few moments. Uh, uh, will you have some cherry cordial, sir? I made it myself. Oh, madame, you are too kind. No, no. I wish only to ask a few questions uh, about your son. Uh, George, what about him? Well, you know, I presume that his late employer was found murdered. Oh, yes, yeah. poor Mr. Tremaine. A kinder man there never was. Every Thursday, George would come around and talk about nothing but his wonderful Mr. Tremaine. Every Thursday, madame? Uh, yes, sir, his day off. Tell me, on April 5th, the day of the murder, he was here that day too, huh? Why, what do you mean, Mr. Perot? Of course he was here. All day? Oh, from, uh, oh, about uh, 2.30 on, he was teaching us to play gin rummy. Uh, do you play gin rummy, miss? No, I'm not very good at cards, and I don't drink. Tell me, madame, where is your son now? I, I believe he's over at Mr. Tremaine's place, straightening things up, you know. I see, I see. Eh bien, you've both been very kind. Oh, m must you go so soon? Ah, well, well, I said it would only be a moment. Come, Abigail. Well, I'm sorry George wasn't home. Uh, we'll tell him you were here. Merci yeah. bien, madame. Lovely old couple, aren't they? I don't see how their son could do anything wrong. Hmm. I do not see how he can be their son. What? Well, did you not observe, Abby, that the kindly old gentleman and his wife... They both have fair hair and blue eyes. Yes. But Monsieur Hackett, his eyes are dark brown. It is impossible, Abigail, for two blonde, blue-eyed parents to have anything but blue-eyed children. I help you, sir. Oh, yes, if you don't mind. I am interested in a necklace which you recently sold to a Mr. Archie Tremaine. Really? Uh, may I ask what your interest is? Oh, my name is Hercule Poirot. I would like Hercule to... Hercule Poirot, the brilliant Belgian detective. Oh, monsieur, I am flattered. Most people take me for French. Oh, we've heard of you, the diamond people in Antwerp. They speak your name with reverence. Well, thank you, thank you. Now, uh, about this necklace. Oh, yes. You yes. you did sell a necklace to Monsieur Tremaine, eh? Yes, a very fine pearl necklace. Uh, let's see, it was delivered to him on uh, April 3rd. April 3rd? Two days before he was murdered. Yeah, this puts a new light on everything. How so, Chief? Well, the motive, Abbe. If the motive was robbery, Monsieur Fields is clear. He himself is very wealthy. He would not kill for jewels. But it's gone, Chief. Who took it? I do not know, Abby. But when we find the person who has the necklace, we will have the murderer. In that case, Mr. Poirot, you'll have to arrest me. Eh? You? I have the necklace right here. Mr. Tremaine returned it on... Uh, let me see... Um, on April 5th, last Thursday. You, Monsieur Tremaine himself returned it? Yes, Mr. Poirot. He'd bought it on the understanding that he could return it within ten days. He walked in here last Thursday. He said he'd changed his mind about the lady and the necklace. And you refunded his money? Eh? Yes. As a matter of fact, we gave him the cash. It was just after three and the banks were closed. He said he was leaving town that night. Well, there you are, Chief. That brings Mr. Fields right back into the picture. Monsieur... You are quite certain that it was Archie Tremaine who was here? Positive. Well, his picture was in the papers every other week. I imagine everybody knew what Archie Tremaine looked like. The silver hair, the monocle. Oh, no, no, then it must be so. Come, Abigail. There is still one small matter about which I must satisfy myself. Where are we going, Chief? To the library, Abby, to do some research. The library? What do you expect to find there? The biography of a murderer. <laughs> Why, Miss Fields, this is a surprise. Hackett, I had to come here to Mr. Tremaine's house. I had to come and see for myself. Is there anything... I'm terribly sorry, Miss. I've gone through all of Mr. Tremaine's belongings and there's not the slightest clue, not the slightest suggestion that anyone else could have killed him. It's horrible. Horrible. 
They've indicted him, Hackett. They're going to try my father for murder. Yes, I know. They were about to let him go because of that missing necklace. And, and then that... they found out that it had been returned. I, I can't understand it. I can't believe that Archie returned it. We were going to be married. It was all agreed. Well, miss, your father was so set against it that perhaps... Oh, no, that would have made Archie more stubborn. If I could... Wait. I've just thought of something. What time was that necklace returned? A little after three, according to the jeweler. At least that's what the papers say. A little after three? Yes, miss. But that's impossible. Oh, why didn't I think of it sooner? It's impossible, Hackett, because Archie was with me at the theater from 2.30 until 5. He couldn't have been at the jeweler's. You must be mistaken, miss. Oh, no, no, I'm not. The necklace was returned. Well, then someone else returned it. Someone else returned it and got the money for it. But no one had access to it except Mr. Tremaine. Oh, no one but Mr. Tremaine. And you. Me? You, Hackett. You had access to the necklace, and you knew my father had threatened Archie. You, you're the murderer. You... Sit very quietly, Miss Fields. I don't want to shoot you unless I have to. You killed him. You stole the pearls, and you framed my father. I'm going to call the police. No, you don't. Oh. Tremaine tried that. Now he's dead. No, that won't do either. The door is locked. I locked it as you came in. Get away from me. Get away! I'm sorry, my dear. Now I'll just gag you so that you're not tempted to scream again. There we are. Now. Hello, Daisy. I have a little job for you. <laughs> no, it's not as hard as the other one. Doesn't require as much talent. Is that laundry wagon still available? It is. If I have Pete drive it down here to Tremaine's place, I'll have a, a bundle ready for him. <laughs> Oh. Uh, bonjour, Monsieur Hackett. Uh, may we come in? Why, uh, the, the place is topsy-turvy, Mr. Poirot. I'm in the middle of packing. Good, good, good. I, I may be of some help to you. You know, I have a very orderly mind. Come, Abigail. Hey. Oh, but, Monsieur, this is not the middle of the packing. It is barely the beginning. Yes, uh, the other rooms are all done. I've left this one for the last. And after this room is packed away... The curtain will ring down on Archie Tremaine. Ah, oui, oui. You uh, phrase it so well. <laughs> of course, there is still the small matter of punishing the murderer. Yes, I know. You know, I feel sorry for him. Uh, for whom? For Mr. Fields. He's not really a murderer. I mean, say, he's not the criminal type. He was driven to do what he did. Oh, you know, that, that is very interesting, Monsieur Hackett. Very interesting. I see, I see that you are uh, quite a student of criminology. Well... Uh, oh, come, come, my friend. Do not be so modest. You have many accomplishments. Have I? But of course, of course. For example, I would suggest that you have at one time been uh, an actor. Uh, what? Do not leap so, Monsieur. Look, you frighten my secretary. She has dropped your glove. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, my glove. Uh, well, you, you startled me, uh, Mr. Poirot. I didn't think that anybody would remember me. I gave up the theater some years ago. Au contraire, monsieur. I, I do not remember you. I, I never saw you. But you still use the expressions of the theater. Did you not say, Monsieur Tremaine always wants top billing? <laughs> you see? Tell me, um, what was your thought on the stage? Impersonations, n'est-ce pas? I did some impersonations. Why? No, I was merely wondering if your experience as an actor could have something to do with this case. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, by a strange coincidence, monsieur, this case involves a very clever impersonation. Really? Oh, uh, that's the back door. You're expecting a delivery, eh? No, it must be the laundry wagon. I'm sending out all the soil stuff. Wait, monsieur Hackett. I will go with you. You will... What? I will go with you. I have a tremendous interest in this uh, laundry. 
Why, there's no need for you to go. The bundle is already at the back door. Nevertheless, I should like to see it. You know, I have developed an overwhelming curiosity about the laundry ever since I picked up this glove from the floor. Glove? Oui. One solitary, unaccounted-for lady's glove. It was careless of you, Monsieur Ackett, to leave it lying about. You were much more methodical when you did away with Archie Tremaine. What? You don't know what you're talking about. I assure you, my friend, I know precisely what I'm talking about. You are a thief, Monsieur Ackett. You have been one since you gave up the acting five years ago. Yes. Ah, yes, monsieur. I looked it up. You have plied your trade by posing as a valet or butler and stealing from your employer when the opportunity presented itself. In this case, the opportunity came on the day you saw the necklace Monsieur Tremaine had bought from his fields. You stole the necklace and went to the jewelers, impersonating Tremaine, and received the cash for it. Why, you're mad. Unfortunately, Monsieur Tremaine found you out the very same day. He threatened to call the police. So you killed him. And then, then a delicious thought occurred to you, monsieur. The thought of implicating an innocent man. So you called the police to tell them of a murder. That was a mistake, monsieur. That was when I All started right, to believe... All right, Poirot. You're clever, but you talk too much. I guess Pete will have two more bundles to take with him. Okay, Pete. Stick him up, Haggard. What I thought... Where's Pete? Don't worry. We've got him nice and safe in a patrol wagon. Right where you'll be in just a minute. You see, monsieur? Your goose is boiled. to listen next week when Agatha Christie, America's favorite mystery writer, brings you her favorite detective, Hercule Poirot, in the case of Death Points a Finger. Agatha Christie's Poirot is directed by Carl Eastman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is Old Time Radio USA, your source for the classic old time radio shows you love. Your Rexall Drugstore presents its new series of summer shows starring Ray Bolger and as a special guest tonight, the MGM star Van Johnson. Ray Bolger, Van Johnson, Jerry Sullivan, Roy Bargey and his orchestra, and yours truly, Howard Petrie, brought to you by your friendly Rexall Drugstore. Rexall, an old familiar name that has always stood for quality and value. Well, now, let's pick up Ray Bolger as he enters Simpkins' restaurant for his breakfast. He has food on his mind, and his heart is set on a platter of bacon and eggs. Say, he's a pretty sloppy eater, isn't he? Since my gal and I live in California <laughs> What's the matter, Ray? You're not the happy chap you used to be What's wrong? Girl trouble? Well, from now on, Mr. Simpkins, I'm not going to give girls a second thought No? Why not? I can't get past my first thought <laughs> I just can't seem to get anywhere with girls I guess I'm too bashful. Well, Ray, if you can't get anywhere with girls, why don't you give up? Well, I talked to my friend Van Johnson about it, and he said I could get any girl I wanted to if I just exercised, if I built myself up to be a key man. That's an idea, Ray. I think you are run down. I know it. Why, yesterday afternoon, I saw a pretty girl in the street, and I winked at her. Well, what happened? She winked back, and it blew me over. <laughs> so I'm not going to try to get anywhere with girls until Van builds me up. He's meeting me here in a little while, and... We're going to start. So you know Van Johnson, huh? Now there's my idea of a mighty nice guy. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, in a way, that's a compliment to me. You see, uh, Van and I are practically identical. (laughs) You and Van Johnson identical? Why, he's young. Well, I'm young. He's handsome. Well, I'm... uh, He's popular with the girls. Well, I'm... uh... 
Well, one out of three isn't bad. <laughs> and besides, I'll be popular with the girls, too. Van says all I have to do is build myself up a little. That's why we're playing golf today. Oh, come now, Ray. Exercise will never help you. You're too skinny. Uh, get on that scale over there. I don't have to. I weighed myself on that scale yesterday, and I weighed 97 pounds. <laughs> Stripped. Stripped? Yes, I took the scale into the phone booth. Oh. And I'm not taking any chances of having girls turn me down in the meantime, either. Hello? Until I build myself up, I'm not going to look another girl in the eye. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're Ray Bolger, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess I am. I guess you don't remember me. We haven't seen each other since we were in the sixth grade of school. I'm Pamela Forbes. Oh, Pamela Forbes. Oh, yeah. I remember you. Gee, I, I used to call you Pinky on account of your red hair. That's right. And I used to call you Stinky on account of... Well, well it's good to see you again. <laughs> Say, uh, you never graduated from our school, did you? No, I went to the university. But tell me, Ray, how high did you get in school? Why, Pamela, I never touched the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> See, I always knew that if I ever saw you again, you'd be beautiful like this. Oh, uh, Ray. <laughs> That's a lovely dress you're wearing. Mm -hmm. It fits you to a T. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, especially around the LSMF. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I ran into you, Ray. I'm having a little party for some friends at my house tonight, and I'd like you to <laughs> drop in. <laughs> to drop in? Uh, you mean you want me just as I am, with no exercise? Well, I don't know what you mean, Ray, but perhaps we can get alone together this evening, and you can explain it to me. We get alone together. <laughs> Oh, boy. Excuse me just a minute. Hey, Mr. Simpkin. Yeah? You've got to do me a favor. Call Van Johnson on the phone and tell him not to come here. But I thought he was going to show you how to be popular with girls. Look, I'm doing all right with this one. But if he comes over and she gets a look at him, oh, I might lose her. Now call Van up and tell him to stay away. Here's a nickel. Okay. And here's another nickel. Tell him positively. <laughs> uh uh It's too late, Ray. Look who's coming in the door. Van Johnson. Hi, Ray. Are you all set? Uh, yes. I nearly was until you walked in. Look, Van. <laughs> I can't play golf with you this afternoon. Really, I can't play golf. I can't. Uh, uh, my, uh, my mother's sick. Oh, that, that's too bad. Why didn't you call Dr. Gillespie? <laughs> I did call him. But he was out in the case with Dr. Pepper. Well, uh, perhaps I... Uh... Ay, 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 ay. Who is that beautiful girl sitting alone at that table? You stay away from her. What do you mean? I mean, uh, oh, uh, uh, that's my mother. <laughs> you might, uh, you might catch something. Your mother? She looks awfully young. Uh, young. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, she's uh, yeah, young. Uh, she married at a very early age, a very early age. <laughs> she's a hillbilly. Raymond! Raymond Bolger! Coming, mother! Excuse me, Van. I'll be right back. What is it, Pamela? Who is that handsome man you're talking to? Uh, handsome? Uh, oh, uh, oh, oh no, that, that's my father. Oh. <laughs> oh, don't be silly. Isn't that Van Johnson? Uh, oh, well, you could call him that. And isn't he a movie star? Well, uh, he plays a part now and then. <laughs> oh, I simply must meet him. Hello, Mr. Johnson. My name is Pamela. How do you do? Ray has been telling me about you. He has? Yes. How is everything back in the hills? <laughs> I'm one of Ray's girlfriends, but now that I've met you, I, I think things will be different. Oh, thank you. I think you're very nice. Oh, meeting you like this is a thrill I'll never forget. Oh, it's been a pleasure for me, too. Oh, Mr. Johnson, I think at this moment I'm the happiest girl in the world. Would anybody care to play my part? I'm having a little party at my house tonight, Van, and it would make me awfully happy if you'd attend. Why, thank you. I'd love to. Hey, uh, what about me? You're supposed to be my girl. Oh, Ray, you don't have to worry about that. I don't? No, just bring another girl for yourself. Another girl. <laughs> We'll see how Ray and Van make out in just a moment. But now I have an important message. Like the real heroes of war, the heroes of medical research are modest. Many of them are unknown and unsung. 
Yet these men and women are unselfishly devoting their lives to protect you and your family. They're constantly fighting disease and infection, searching for ways to save more lives and relieve suffering. As a tribute to these truly heroic scientists and to the Rexall research men, doctors, chemists, and pharmacists who are working with them, Rexall drugstores have set aside August as Rexall's Salute to Research Month. In a way, your Rexall druggist is working with them, too, for he sees to it that you get the life-saving and pain-relieving medicines your doctor prescribes. He fills every prescription accurately and conscientiously, and he takes pride in his Rexall franchise because he knows that every drug product bearing the Rexall label is completely safe, dependable, and of highest quality. You can rely on your Rexall druggist and on Rexall drug products, because in drugs, if it's Rexall, it's right. Roy Bargy and the orchestra now in a Roy Bargy arrangement of a medley of Jerome Kern tunes. We rejoin Ray Bolger and Van Johnson in Simpkins' restaurant, where a slight argument is in progress. Chief Van, I don't need exercise until Pamela saw you. I was doing all right as I was. Ray, I tell you, you'll never get anywhere with girls or in pictures either if you don't put on some weight. Oh, I don't know. Gary Cooper does all right, and he's skinny. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if someday I didn't develop into a super Cooper. Now, take my advice and put on some weight, or you'll never be anything but a puny muni. <laughs> Now, let's see how much you weigh. Get on that scale over there. I weigh 100 pounds and stop shoving. Get on the scale. Come on, come on. There. Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. 71 pounds. <laughs> well, wait till I get my other foot on. There. Now, what does it say? 72 pounds. <laughs> and you said you weighed 100. Well, you don't expect me to wear my winter underwear in August. <laughs> Gee, Van, isn't there any solution to my problem besides exercise? What's the secret of your success with girls? Uh, well, if I tell you, do you promise not to blab it around? I promise. Scout's honor? Scout's honor. What is the secret of your success? Bubble bath. <laughs> I tried that once, and I went up with the bubbles. Oh. 
Come on now, Ray. Stop stalling. You've got to exercise, and that's final. Well, okay. I'll exercise if you think it'll help me get parts at MGM like you get. Gee, I, I sure envy you playing in between two women. <laughs> and what women? Marilyn Maxwell and Gloria DeHaven. And then you had Esther Williams and Thrill of a Romance. Oh, and that's not all, Ray. My next is Weekend at the Waldorf with Lana Turner. Ugh. Weekend at the Waldorf with Lana Turner. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the best I've been able to do is luncheon at the commissary with Marjorie Maine. <laughs> oh, well. If you're going to build me up, let's get going. That's right. Let's start by going over to the gym. Thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five. Keep it up, Ray. You're doing fine. Yeah. I can yo-yo swell now, can't I? Ray, these setting up exercises will develop your stomach muscles. But that isn't the side I set up on. Now, don't argue. If we're going to go to Pamela's party, you'll want to look healthy and strong. Now, get on that rowing machine. Okay. Now, begin. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. Hey, why'd you stop rowing? I don't want to go out too far. I can't swim. <laughs> Come on, keep rowing. It develops the chest. Yeah, I know. George Raff used to do it, but he had to quit. Why? His chest was getting so big he couldn't get his pants on. <laughs> Not so much talking. Keep rowing. I'd better see if I could find some oil around here. That rowing machine is pretty squeaky. That's not the machine. That's me. <laughs> Can't I quit now, Van? I'm strong enough. Just feel the muscles in my back. They stick out like eggs. Squeeze one. Mmm, powdered eggs. Gee, <laughs> some bowling alley. These are the funniest looking pins I've ever seen. You mean the ones on the alley? No, the ones on the waitresses. <laughs> <laughs> well, what am I supposed to do now? Oh, bowling is easy. Now, put your fingers in the bowling ball. Yeah. Start running. Okay. Now, throw it and let go. Uh, Ray, I said let go. <laughs> On horseback riding, the secret is to let the horse know who's boss. Okay. Get up. Hello, 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 Ray, I said the secret of horseback riding is to show the horse who's boss. I heard you the first time. Tell the horse. Now, the secret in weightlifting is to always keep your back straight. Now, pick up the bar and raise it slowly over your head. How's that? Oh, that's fine. Now, let it down and I'll put some weights on it. Okay. <laughs> Here, I'll toss you a 50-pound weight. Careful, don't drop it. Yeah? Come on down here in the cellar. It's cooler here. Oh, Van, you told me all this exercise would build me up. It did. Just get on that scale. Hey, look. My penny came back. What does the card say? No charge for anything less than 50 pounds. <laughs> Turn to our charm department with beauteous Jerry Sullivan singing, It's Gotta Be This or That. If you ain't wrong, you're right. If it ain't dark, it's light. If you ain't sure, you might. It's gotta be this or that. If it ain't full, it's blank. If you don't spend, you bank. If it ain't big, it's frank. Gotta be this or that. Who can it be if it ain't me? I know it's not your mother. Can't you see it's gotta be one way or the other? Tell me what I must know. If you don't like, I'll go. If it ain't yes, 
store's dependability is a regular customer. Your Rexall druggist is proud of the fact that most of his customers are regulars. They come back again and again because they've learned that the Rexall label is their safeguard of purity and quality. One of the many dependable Rexall drug products is Rexall Pure Test Aspirin. It's laboratory tested for accuracy and correct potency. And every tablet contains five full grains of true aspirin. Ask for Rexall Pure Test Aspirin and other Rexall products for all your drug needs at your dependable Rexall drugstore. When you buy Rexall, you buy safety and satisfaction. Because in drugs, if it's Rexall, it's right. Now let's join Van and Ray on the way to Pamela's party. Van... Do we have to go to Pamela's party? Those exercises have knocked me out. Let's turn back. Ray, there's no turning back. Columbus didn't turn back. Magellan didn't turn back. Hepplewhite didn't turn back. Who's Hepplewhite? An uncle of mine who was leaving his wife. <laughs> now, seriously, Ray, I don't see why you should have such a tough time getting a girl. Didn't you uh, ever ask a girl to come up and see your etchings? Uh, sure I did. One night I got a beautiful girl to come up and see my etchings. Well, what happened? She bought two. <laughs> Come on, let's walk up to the door. Boy, am I tired. Here's the front door. Okay, you can put me down now. Shall I ring the doorbell? Oh, no, don't bother. I'll do it. Just lift my arm up. Thanks. Now push my elbow. Man, don't you think I should have gotten out of this turtleneck sweater before coming to the party? Oh, no, it makes you look athletic. Be strong, be dashing, be swashbuckling. Can't you do that? Oh, sure, I can swashbuckle. But the way I feel now, I'll swash from the waist up and buckle from the knees down. <laughs> I still think I should have changed this turtleneck sweater. Oh, look, Pamela, a turtle! Yeah. <laughs> Hey, how about introducing me? Oh, oh, yes. Girls, I brought over a star from MGM. Oh, look, girls, it's the son of Lassie. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Come on, Van, dance with me. Oh, uh, but Pamela, I dance. <laughs> how, how about singing for us, Van? Uh, I sing. Van, play the piano for us. I play. Gee, Van, you're wonderful. <laughs> I guess I'm in a non-essential industry. Now, just a second, girls. Before I start dancing, I want to make sure my friend Ray is taken care of. Would one of you care to play a fast game of ping-pong with him? Okay, I'll play ping-pong with Ray. Well, there he is. Carry him into the other room. <laughs> Never mind. Carry him into the other room. I'm going over and get something to eat. Come on, Van. I want to show you the garden. Uh, but I really don't think we should. Whoop. My, you've got a strong arm. <laughs> Let's sit here on this bench. Oh, I, I don't think we'd better. Why not? The sign says wet paint. Oh, well, then let's sit on the swing. But I don't want to. Come on! Nice swing. Oh, Van, 
you're so romantic. Tell me, how did you meet your first girl? Uh, well, I was sitting across from her in a restaurant, and the lights were low. Yes, go on. What did you say to her? Uh, nothing. The waiter came along and bumped our table, and my leg of lamb sort of crossed legs with her leg of lamb. Oh, Van, you're so romantic. Oh, there you are, Van. Uh, Boy, what a party. There's a guy in there who keeps going to the bar and pouring three toes of bourbon. You mean three fingers? No, three toes. He's got a sandwich in each hand. <laughs> we played games, too. In one game, you hold a lighted candle and a mirror and walk backwards. You're supposed to marry the first person you see in the mirror. And who are you going to marry? The janitor. Someone left the laundry chute open. <laughs> no kidding, Ray. Did you finally get a girl? Oh, did I get a girl? I met a dame dressed just like a duchess. I hope you introduced yourself properly. Why, naturally, naturally, old boy. I bowed from the waist, clicked my heels, and kissed her on the nose. Well, why didn't you kiss her on the hand? Her nose stuck out further. Oh, there you are, Raisy. Come here to me, Raisy, oh. darling. Oh, oh, the Duchess. I'm scramming. Run, Ray. Run. After all this exercise you gave me, I can't even walk. If I take another step, I'll meet a fate worse than death. Oh, Raisy, I've got you. Kiss me. <laughs> I mean, Van, look, lady, you don't want me. There's Van Johnson. Oh, I want you. Who wants Van Johnson? <laughs> 70 million... <laughs> oh, life. 70 million women in this country, and I got her. Oh, you precious, puny little pixie, you. <laughs> Let me hold you tight. Let me crush you in my arms. Mm. I haven't been in claws like this since the last time I had lobster for dinner. <laughs> Man, please, get me out of this. Well, how can I get you out of it? Well, you gave me rowing exercise that broke my back. You gave me a bowling exercise that broke my leg. Well, what do you want now? Give me an exercise that'll break this dame's arm. <laughs> Ray and Van will be back in just a moment. Folks, when you're burning up and miserable after an overdose of sun, what's the one thing you want? I know what I want. Well, then sing it out, honey. Three little words, that's all I care for. Three little words. And those three words are? Rexall Gypsy Cream. Right, Jerry. Because Rexall Gypsy Cream spells relief. Cooling, soothing relief from the misery of sunburn, prickly heat, poison ivy, and other minor skin irritations. What's more, you get relief and comfort immediately. Famous Rexall Gypsy Cream is a greaseless lotion, scientifically compounded by Rexall doctors, chemists, and scientists. Because it's a fine seasonal example of Rexall research, it's featured during August, Rexall Salute to Research Month, at Rexall drugstores throughout the United States. Only 50 cents for a large bottle. Ask for Rexall Gypsy Cream and other Rexall drug products at your dependable Rexall drugstore. Remember, in drugs, if it's Rexall, it's right. We've had a jolly evening, and Van, you've done all you can. But in the race for a gal to embrace, I still am an also ran. You eat your Wheaties and toasted bran, you've gone in debt for a coat of tan. I guess I'll never be a glamour man. Girls look at me and say, what a pan. What can I do to get just one fan? Why don't you borrow from Sally, Rand? Well, Van, there's no doubt that you are the Prince Charming of 1945. But Bolger is no Model T, Casanova. No, sir. To wit, a princess is going to be our guest next week. Pray tell, who is your fair maiden? Cass Daly. I know Cass Daly. She isn't a princess. She's more of a lady in waiting. Uh, so she is. So she is. In fact, Cass has been waiting for years. Well, with Cass around, you shouldn't have any trouble in getting a girl. How right you are, Prince. With Cass around, a fellow doesn't have any trouble getting a girl. He has trouble getting away. Alas, alack, and Alaska. 
time is fleeting. Yea, verily, Sir Ray, I must hie myself to the hinterlands. It's really been a pleasure. You all have treated me grand. We've all enjoyed your visit, man. Oh, my. <laughs> Tibbet. <laughs> Drop in whenever you can. Thank you, Van. Thank you once more, Van Johnson. <laughs> there he goes. Oh, he's a, he really is a swell fella. Really a wonderful guy and a wonderful sport. And I'd like to leave a little message to Jimmy Durandy and Gary Moore, wherever you fellas are on your summer vacation. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. When you turn your radio on next week at this time, you'll hear a great girl with a great talent. Cass Staley. What a girl. And we're going to have a lot of trouble and a lot of fun. And until next week, good luck. And, uh, oh, good night, folks. Friday night, same time, same station, when we'll be back with another Ray Bolger show for your Rexall drugstore. Incidentally, that script is just being tossed out into the audience. That's the reason for all the background. In the meantime, friends, visit the friendly Rexall druggist who brings you these programs. Remember, he's a Rexall druggist because he carries the high-quality drug products that bear the Rexall name. And in drugs, if it's Rexall, it's right. This is the time to prepare for winter. This coming winter will unquestionably find the domestic fuel situation tighter than ever. Civilians should get their home ready for the cold weather now by stocking up early on whatever kind and amount of fuel their dealer can let them have. Remember then, friends, it's next Friday night for Ray Bolger, Cass Daly, Roy Bargy and his orchestra, Jerry Sullivan and yours truly, Howard Petrie. This program is directed by Cecil Underwood. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Your favorite old-time radio shows from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. You're listening to Old Time Radio USA, part of the WOTR Radio Network.